Hello there! I'm on my way to Florence, Italy to learn about the Renaissance and some well-known Renaissance artists. I'm glad you decided to join me. This should be a lot of fun. Hooray! We've made it to Florence. Florence, Italy is a city full of famous landmarks. Look! There's the Ponte Vecchio Bridge with all its shops. Over there, I see the Palazzo Vecchio. And there is the Dome of Santa Maria del Fiore. Now, if I can only find my friend, Polly. Puffer, look down. Hey, Puffer, down here. Hi, Polly. Whoa! I keep telling him not to tip his hat when he's flying. Puffer, isn't it time you took those landing lessons? I'm beginning to think I need swimming lessons. I don't know what I can teach you about swimming, but you're in the perfect place to learn about the Renaissance. This fountain? <laughs> no, silly. Florence, Italy. Many people say Florence is where the Renaissance started. Ah, so that's why you came here to study art. You got it. As a matter of fact, I'm studying for my Renaissance art class right now. Care to join me? That would be splendid. I have a great book about the Renaissance that I'm sure will answer all your questions, Puffer. It's in here somewhere. Ah, here it is. So, Puffer, what would you like to know? First, I need to know what Renaissance means. It's a word that means new beginning. The Renaissance began a long time ago in Italy. It was a time of great ideas. Some of those ideas were borrowed from other places and other times. How did people in Italy find these ideas? Did they have a time machine? In a way, they did. <laughs> The Greeks and Romans from olden times had many important ideas about art, architecture, and writing. Some of what they made was forgotten for many years. When their work was rediscovered, the old ideas were also found again. Renaissance artists, architects, and writers used these old ideas to create new work of their own. Living during the Renaissance must have been just like living in old-time Greece and Rome. Not exactly. There were lots of brand new ideas popping up too. For example, people began to look closely at nature. Lots of new inventions were conceived and paintings and sculptures began to look more realistic. Maybe you'd like to learn about a man with some amazing ideas who lived during the Renaissance. His name was Leonardo da Vinci. Leonardo was born in a little town in Italy called Vinci. Wait a minute! Leonardo had a town named after him? <laughs> no, silly. Leonardo was named after the town. When he was growing up, Leonardo was interested in just about everything. He would learn all he could about nature by closely studying the countryside around his home. Leonardo would record what he learned by writing and drawing in his sketchbook. He soon learned to draw so well that his father sent him to Florence to study art with a well-known artist. Before too long, Leonardo became a skilled painter, and he soon moved to the city of Milan. In Milan, Leonardo worked as a sculptor, a painter, and an art teacher. During this time, Leonardo also made drawings for lots of inventions. Among his many ideas were drawings for buildings, a bicycle, an armored tank, and a flying machine. He was one busy artist. He sure was, but that isn't everything he did. Leonardo began to study the human body to figure out how muscles and bones worked. It's also said that Leonardo would follow people as they walked along the street just to make sketches of them. I'd like to see one of Leonardo's drawings. You're in luck. The next page is a drawing that Leonardo called Five Grotesque Heads. Grotesque means to be unusual. 
Some of the people in this drawing are certainly unusual. <laughs> Indeed, but more important than that is that Leonardo thought that faces could show what people were really like. So a person who smiles a lot might be happy most of the time, and a person who frowns might be sad. Exactly. If we could meet the people in this drawing, what do you think they might be like, Polly? Hmm. The person who is laughing with his mouth wide open might be someone who jokes a lot. And the people who are grinning might like to hear his jokes. Could be. What do you think about the man with the wreath around his head? What would he be like if we met him? He looks serious. Just look at his mouth and eyes. He's certainly not joking or laughing. I wonder if he is someone important. Maybe so. Sometimes wreaths like that can be worn as a crown. I like the way Leonardo shows how each person in the drawing is so different. Me too. Leonardo certainly knew how to show different ideas about people in his drawings. You can say that again. Does your book show other artworks by Leonardo? Oh, sure. Here's a good one. The title of the painting is Mona Lisa. This is one of the most famous paintings in the world. Why is the Mona Lisa so famous, Polly? The painting was the first to show lots of new ideas. What sort of new ideas? One idea is that Leonardo didn't draw outlines. Instead, Leonardo carefully used his paint to show light and shadows. Look closely at Mona Lisa's face and hands, and you'll see what I mean. Another new idea that we can see in the painting is that Mona Lisa seems to be closer to us than the roads, trees, and sky. Mona Lisa has lots of details, but the background seems fuzzy. A third idea is one that is very important. If you could draw a line from elbow to elbow and up both arms to the top of her head, you would see a triangle. This pose makes Mona Lisa look as if she is relaxed. Many photographs that are taken of people today have this same pose. Who was Mona Lisa? Was she a real lady? Was she someone important? There have been lots of stories about Mona Lisa and who she was. You'll have to read about the painting and decide for yourself. Leonardo was certainly an interesting artist. I agree, Puffer. Leonardo's ideas change the way we think about art. Were other Renaissance artists as interesting as Leonardo? Yes, indeed. Another exciting Renaissance artist was a man named Michelangelo. Michelangelo Buonarroti was born in a little Italian town called Caprese. When he was just a baby, Michelangelo was sent to live with a stonecutter's family. Stonecutter? A stonecutter cuts marble from mountains to be used for sculptures and buildings. Did Michelangelo use the marble to create sculptures? Not then. When he was about 10 years old, Michelangelo started going to school in Florence. He began to draw the life and artwork he saw around the city. Michelangelo soon decided he wanted to be an artist. His father was not happy about this, but he later agreed to let Michelangelo study with one of the best painters in Florence. Michelangelo's talent soon caught the eye of Lorenzo the Magnificent, the most important man in Florence. Lorenzo was so impressed that he invited Michelangelo to live in his palace and study with a well-known sculptor. It was here that Michelangelo learned how to use hammers and chisels to carve designs into stone. Sadly, in a few years, things changed in Florence. Lorenzo's family had to leave their palace. Michelangelo then traveled to Rome. Before too long, he was hired to carve a statue. The statue was called Pieta. Pieta is an Italian word that means pity. The sculpture is about a Bible story. 
In this sculpture, we see Jesus being held by his mother, Mary. Here's a question for you, Puffer. Do you see a design element that is the same in both Pieta and Mona Lisa? Let me think. I've got it. It's the triangle design. You're right. If I trace an imaginary line from the top of Mary's head, down her arms, and across the body of Jesus, I see a triangle shape. The imaginary triangle helps to point out the most important parts of the sculpture. That makes it easy to see what the sculpture is about. Right again. Are there other important ideas to know about Michelangelo's sculpture? Oh, yes. Before Michelangelo's time, sculpture did not look quite as real as Pieta. Just look at Mary's face. Do you see how Michelangelo was able to show her sadness? Her head is tilted down. Her eyes are closed. And she isn't smiling. Now look at the folds of her robe. The folds look real. When Michelangelo first showed Pieta, everyone was amazed at its beauty and how real the sculpture looked. Even today, people come from all over the world to visit Rome and see Pieta. Did Michelangelo make other famous artworks? Oh my, yes. Sculpture was Michelangelo's favorite kind of art, but he also made some very famous paintings. One of his best-known paintings is on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel in the Vatican. A ceiling? That's a funny place for a painting. Painting the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel was no joke. Not only is the ceiling as big as a tennis court, it is also about 60 feet above the floor. Phew! That's way up there! <laughs> it certainly is. Each day, Michelangelo had to climb to the top of some scaffolds. When he got to the top, he then had to paint above his head. Yikes! That couldn't have been easy! And to make the job even more difficult, the painting is a fresco. That means it was painted onto wet plaster. Michelangelo had to paint quickly before the plaster dried. I'd like to see the Sistine Chapel ceiling. Your wish is my command. Remember that Michelangelo's painting is very big. What you see here is only one small part of the Sistine Chapel ceiling. This part of the painting is called the Creation of Adam. It is in the center of the ceiling. The Creation of Adam is a Bible story that tells how the first man was created by God. The figure to the right is supposed to be God. The figure on the left is supposed to be the first man, Adam. An important part of this painting is the fingertips. See how the fingers of the two figures are touching? People often say that the figures in this painting look a lot like the sculptures that Michelangelo carved. Do you see the muscles in Adam's arms? I do! They look very real! Michelangelo studied the human body and knew exactly how muscles worked. Hey, didn't Leonardo do that too? Indeed he did! You have a good memory, Puffer! Michelangelo is called one of history's greatest artists. I can certainly see why. I have a little more time until I have to go to class. Would you like to learn about another Renaissance artist? Yes, please. Ah, here we are, Raphael Sanzio. Raphael was born in the Italian town of Urbino. His father was a painter and a poet who worked for a prince. When he was a little boy, Raphael helped out in his father's studio. As Raphael grew up, he became very popular. He had lots of friends. Someone once said that even the animals loved Raphael. Later, Raphael began to study art with a famous artist in Perugia. It didn't take long for Raphael to master painting, drawing, and perspective. Perspective? What's that? Have you ever seen a painting that looked like you could walk right into it? Sure! Perspective is what makes a painting look that way. 
If you tried walking into a painting done before the Renaissance, you could find it hard to get around. Why is that, Polly? Some parts would be painted like you were standing below them. Other parts would be painted like you were looking down at them from above. Hello down there! Renaissance artists learned how to paint a picture from one point of view. This one looks like I could fly right into it. Better not try. It's still a painting. I'd like to see the way Raphael shows perspective in his paintings. I've got a perfect example. It's a painting by Raphael called The School of Athens. Raphael made this painting for the Vatican. The School of Athens almost fills up an entire wall. Do you see how the people who are closest to the bottom of the painting are larger than those who are near the center? I do! That's another way that artists show perspective in artworks. People and objects that are drawn larger seem to be closer than people and objects that are drawn small. Who are all these people, Polly? They are famous people from history. You might recognize some of them. This is the famous philosopher, Plato. But he looks like Leonardo da Vinci. That's because Raphael used Leonardo as a stand-in for Plato. And this is Michelangelo, who was used as a stand-in for another Greek philosopher. Is Raphael in the painting, too? Indeed he is, but Raphael is a little more difficult to find. Look closely on the right side of the painting. That's Raphael looking at us. Ho-ho! So it is! Raphael was quite a clever artist, don't you think? Indeed! I have time to show you one more painting before my class starts. Would you like to see it? Yes, please! The title of this painting is St. George and the Dragon. The painting tells a story about a brave soldier who saved a princess from a wicked dragon. That sounds scary! But tell me about it anyway. Long ago, near a small village, there lived a very bad dragon. To make the dragon happy, the people who lived in the village made sure the dragon had plenty to eat. Sometimes they took sheep for the dragon to eat, and sometimes they took young maidens. Oh my goodness! One day, the daughter of the king was chosen. The princess was afraid, but she put on her most beautiful clothes and went to meet the dragon. All of a sudden, as the princess waited for the dragon to come out of its cave, a brave soldier came to her rescue. The princess was saved, and so was the village. Nobody had to be afraid of the dragon anymore. Is that a true story, Polly? Oh, no, silly. Dragons aren't real. But George was a real man. Phew! That bell means it's time for class. I better get going. I don't want to be late. Thanks for helping me learn about the Renaissance, Polly. My pleasure, Puffer. Feel free to drop in anytime. Wings? Check. Landing gear? Check. And away I go! I hope you had a good time learning about three important Renaissance artists. The next time you read an art book or visit an art museum, see if you can find some artwork by Leonardo, Michelangelo, or Raphael. Until next time, goodbye!
Thank you.